Tell me how do you handle the guilt of your past? Tell me how do you deal with the shame? And tell me how do you smile when your heart has been broken and filled with pain? When you've given your all and it seems like it's never enough Well, you just stand when there's nothing left to do You just stand and watch the Lord see you through Yes, after you've done all you can You just Stand and be sure Be not entangled by this bondage again You just stand and endure For God has a purpose And it's all in His plan Tell me what do you do when you Good afternoon, everybody, and I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Uh, it's good to be with you again, and we just welcome you here on this Sunday afternoon. Uh, the sun has been shining. It's been a very special weekend, and even though we are quarantined and we know that people are still with the family, if not uh, virtually, by talking to them online or certainly pulling them up maybe in a Zoom conversation, maybe you have family around you. Uh, this time of the year in Israel, there will be many flocking to the garden tomb uh, where it is, uh, it is said that Jesus may have laid. We don't know. It's been so many thousands of years ago. Uh, but they would go, and just as the old uh, man right there is peeking inside, we wanted to look inside ourselves. Alina and I had a chance to go and look in there, and I'm so glad, and you should be thrilled this morning, that one thing we found out about it, it is empty. The garden tomb is empty, and because it's empty, you and I have an opportunity uh, to live. And so he is risen. And so they can just shut the door on the tomb uh, because he is certainly risen and gone. So we join in the world in celebrating the fact that we serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. I know that he's living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him which is all the time, he's always near. Uh, he does live, and we thank the Lord that he lives, and we love sharing about him. We've been uh, at the halfway point of our Daniel and Revelation experience called Closing the Distance, Closing the Distance, and we're certainly seeking to close the distance uh, between heaven and earth. Uh, we have used the books of uh, Revelation and the books of Daniel along with my colleague, uh, Pastor uh, Charlie uh, Jenkins, who has been bringing insight into the book of Revelation, and I have been bringing uh, the prophecies of the book of Daniel. And it's been wonderful. We are moving along uh, with the book. It's not a very long book, uh, per se. It's only 12 chapters in it, uh, and there's so much more to glean from it. There's so much more that you can get from this book, and we're just merely scratching the surface. Uh, but let's have a word of prayer as we go today into the word of Daniel, chapter 8, and ask the Lord to lead us. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. Uh, we thank you for the mercies of another day. Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning. Uh, we thank you for the ability to put the left foot in front of the right foot. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for families. We thank you, Lord, that on this day the world recognizes that we serve a risen Savior and that he is in the world today. We ask you, Lord, to be with those today who are impacted by this virus, and that is the world. In some way, everybody's been impacted. We ask you to be with families who have been uh, certainly affected by death of loved ones and those that are dealing with the virus itself. And Father, we ask you to be with those who even today are beginning to feel symptoms. We just ask you, Lord, to bless them and be with them. In your holy name we pray. 
In the name of Jesus, amen. We love this Savior that we have. And our study today has been like every other study we've had. Our study is coming from the Word of God. The Bible interprets itself. Uh, all you need is a prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you, and he will do it as you open the book and begin to read, as you open the book and begin to study. And people are doing just that. Wherever they are, they're stopping, they're looking to see what is God trying to say to us during this time? Why has God paused the world uh, for this moment? Well, he's done it so that he can speak to us, and we are so glad that he has. One of the things that uh, is the Bible is full of prophecy. In fact, 30% of the Bible is prophecy. But the world is seeking to know what the Lord is saying to us too. And so prophecy, you'll see it in magazines. People are seeking to ask the question about it. Uh, some of the older magazines we've had have had cover topics on prophecy. And the question is, why prophecy? Why prophecy? Well, because, my friend, this Bible is full of it. As I mentioned, over 30% of the Bible is about prophecy and it, it comes in true because we have a God who knows the future and so what he's doing is sharing with us things that must come to pass and as they're being shared all it does is validate what we already know that we serve a loving Savior that loves, loves us and he's trying to save all of us and trying to bring us closer into his care. Uh, the last time you and I were together was last Thursday and uh, last Thursday we were together we went over Daniel chapter 7 uh, it was impactful, it had a lot of information in it, and a lot of good uh, study time in it, but again, we're just scratching uh, the surface. I want to share with you that over the time that we are together for Daniel and Revelation, we try to hit on at least what we call the five big S's of our faith, and uh, those five S's are dealing with the spirit of prophecy, of course, we talked about that, and then certainly the second coming. Uh, everything about Daniel is looking forward Everything about those who love the Lord is looking forward to, to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then there is a topic that uh, we didn't hit on very much, but people are dealing with it right now. And that is the state of the dead. What happens to you when you die? Uh, this study that we're doing is, uh, doesn't dig too deep into it, but I guarantee you, if you stick with us, if you're willing to study more, if you let us know that you'd like to know more about the state of the dead, what happens when you die, uh, we can answer that because God has answered it for us. And then the Sabbath. The Sabbath is important to God. He felt it was important enough to write it with his finger. And so we've talked about the Sabbath. And then today, we'll talk about another significant part of the Bible. And that deals with the sanctuary. The sanctuary. It is such a fascinating study. And not many really get into it. But when you understand it, the Lord shows the pattern. He shows the plan of salvation in the sanctuary. And so we'll deal with a little bit of that today. Uh, when we were together last, we did Daniel chapter 7, and we dealt with kingdoms in collision. Kingdoms in collision. And if you remember, in kingdoms in collision in chapter 7, Daniel had what was his first vision. He was laying on his bed, and he was dreaming, and he dreamed of these animals. They were uh, they were strange animals, and uh, each one of them had something significant about it that stood up. And Daniel, in his dream, he saw these animals, and what we realize from studying chapter 7 of the book of Daniel is that the images or the dream that Daniel had and the animals that he saw were very consistent with what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. Very consistent. In fact, it showed the whole history of the then-known world, or at least the world, as it was impacting the children of God. And so Daniel's dream of animals coincided with Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Those of you who remember, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a great image. And that image that he had a dream of, the head was the head of gold, uh, the shoulders were of silver, uh, his waist was of, of, of copper, or was a, uh, it was like bronze, and then the legs of this image that the king dreamed about was of iron, even down to the toes. And the toes, if you see on the image there, were partly of iron and even partly of clay. And what Nebuchadnezzar was given was God had given him an image of these kingdoms that would come, even showing his kingdom as the first of those uh, to come. His was the head of gold. In fact, uh, he didn't remember his dream and God gave the dream information to Daniel after a prayer. And Daniel was able to share with the king not only what he dreamed, 
but the interpretation of his dream. So the image on the left is what the king had. And then Daniel has his own dream, and Daniel's dream dealt with animals. But what we found out is that the animals that Daniel dreamt about coincided with the image that the king dreamt about. All these animals we're really dealing with were of kingdoms, and kingdoms use animals to represent them. Uh, the first kingdom, being that of Babylon, was represented by a lion. In fact, they, I showed you they've done excavations even now, and they found clay pots and things where it had the symbol of the lion representing the kingdom of Babylon. Uh, countries, nations use animals as symbols, and we've shared before, America's symbol is the eagle. Uh, there's one preacher I love. He likes to remind us that Benjamin Franklin, uh, if he had had his way, the symbol for America would not have been an eagle, but a turkey, of all things. Uh, all countries, or many countries, I should say, have uh, animals that represent them. Uh, it used to be in the Soviet Union, they used the bear. Uh, and uh, you've heard of other countries that will use an animal to represent them. So Daniel's dream, his four animals were synonymous to the kingdoms that the king had dreamed of. And so Babylon being the head, and after Babylon, there was actually a dual kingdom. And we'll talk about that today in chapter 8 of Daniel. A dual kingdom of Media and Persia. But Persia was the strongest, and Persia took over the Medes and became the, uh, the sole focus kingdom. And then Greece. Oh, Greece, what a kingdom. Uh, represented by Alexander the Great in the rapid way he conquered uh, that nation. And then you had Rome. And Rome uh, aired, Rome had its period of time. Each one, as you can see, had a period where they were on the world stage. But what the Lord was showing Daniel and showing King Nebuchadnezzar and showing us is that there will be kingdoms that come, but there's going to be a final kingdom, and that's an everlasting kingdom, and that's the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so today, our topic today is cleansed at last, the cleansing of the sanctuary. And it's Daniel chapter 8. And uh, we'd like to go into that. Hopefully you have your Bibles with you. And uh, you can follow along with us. Uh, in my Bible, Daniel chapter 8, it begins simply and says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, uh, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. In other words, he had already had one vision. This was a second vision. And do you realize something here? We see that he's, uh, they're using uh, to time frames to show when it was in the history. It said in the third year of the reign of, the, of King Belshazzar. Now, in Daniel chapter 5 and 6, we were able to see uh, Belshazzar. We were, he was the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so they're able to give time frames. We do the same thing. Uh, we may say during the Nixon administration, or, or, or we may even remember, some may even remember uh, the Eisenhower administration. Certainly, uh, most of us will remember during the, uh, the Obama administration. That's how we sense times, and uh, they were doing the same thing here in the Bible. In verse 2 of Daniel chapter 8, he says, I, speaking of Daniel, I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision and was by the river Uli. You know, there are people who study uh, the book of Daniel. I told you at the beginning, it's probably one of the most studied books of the Bible. Theologians, historians, uh, certainly archaeologists, uh, because the book has so much. And because the book represents a historical accounting of, of the world, at least the world as we know, that impacted God's children. Now, we, we saw earlier that there's certainly other kingdoms. There was the Ming Dynasty, and uh, you certainly had the Aztec. Uh, but all that's being recorded uh, in, the, in the Bible, in the canon of the Bible, as we know it, is in what we have, uh, speaks mainly of the Middle East. And that's where God's children were and where many of the events that happened impacted them. Daniel was having this vision, this dream, and he said, I lifted up in verse 3. He said, then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before me, uh, before the river, a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, 
but one was higher than the other. And the higher came up last. Hopefully you have your Bibles and it says the same thing. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 4, it says, I saw the ram pushing westward and then northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. Well, Daniel is dreaming again, and this time he's still dreaming about animals. He dreamed about a ram with two horns in the first four verses of Daniel chapter 8. And then let's look at chapter 8, beginning at verse 5. In verse 5 of my Bible, it says this, And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Well, Daniel's had some, some very... Uh, serious dreams and visions, and this one was no different. It goes on to say in verse 6 of chapter 8, And he came to the ram that had two horns, which, had, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram. So here is this he-goat coming to the ram, and he was moved, uh, and he was moved with choler against him and smote the ram and break his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and stomped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hands. You know, these animals represent kingdoms, and, and all God is doing is repeating and enlarging. Repeating and enlarging. In fact, I want you to keep that mindset, even as we share the book of Daniel in the book of Revelation, uh, we are given a first summary of it. But for the real scholar, for the real biblical scholar, for the one who really wants to, uh, you would come and be a part of studies with us. Uh, you would look for lessons which we can offer to you that go into detail. There is Bible commentary you can look at that goes into detail as much as we know in this world uh, that has been shared. And, and there are still many things in the word of God that mankind has not been able to figure out. And if anybody tells you he's figured it all out, that's the first lie he's told you, and you need to be careful of them. Uh, the Bible even tells us we see through a, a glass that is, that is dark, and that, that, you know, we can't right quite see through it, but there are many things that God has revealed to his children. And so as these things have been revealed to us, our understanding is of what God has said based on what God has given us in the Bible, because the Bible... <laughs> interprets itself. How does it do that? We learn because we read line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And the reason you do that, as you do that, you'll find out that the Bible connects all the way through it. So Daniel chapter 8, here he is talking of this he-goat, and this he-goat that comes strong against the ram that he initially dreamed about, and it said he broke him down. Look at verse number 8. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up another notable one toward the four winds of heaven. Verse 9, and out of them came forth a little horn. Now we've heard of this little horn before. We've heard of a little horn that spoke great things. Let's find out about this one here. There came a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land, is what it says in verse number 9 of chapter 8 of the book of Daniel. Verse 10 says this, And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, verse 11, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. The last verse here in this section, uh, verse 12 of chapter 8. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And he cast it down, the truth, to the ground. And it practiced and prospered. Oh, the Bible is so interesting. I don't know about you. This time that God has paused the world 
for this pandemic. Uh, and I know, again, by now, you've probably uh, binged just about every uh, television show that you can think of, and, and, you've, and you've looked at enough television, and you've, uh, hopefully you've gone outside and got some fresh air and, and had some time just to yourself. But in the space where God is given, you must make time for the word of God. You don't have to be a theologian to study the word of God. That's the great thing about it. Anyone who tells you that you can't study or understand the word of God is someone who doesn't know what God has done for us. He has, he has moved the partition so that we can come boldly before the throne of the living God. And we can open the word of God, and we are required to do it. He tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15 to study the word. That's what God says. It says you don't need a man to tell you what the word says. He says you, along with the Holy Spirit, by opening it up, you can find out what God is saying to us. Daniel chapter 8 is what's known as the Bible's longest prophecy. The Bible's longest prophecy. No man knows the day nor the hour when the Lord is coming, and we agree with that. Uh, we are not a church that predicts the time that the Lord is coming, but there are signs that the Lord says to look for. In the book of Matthew 24, he tells you the things to look for. Uh, but in Revelation 14, 7, here's what he says. He says this. He says, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. The hour of his judgment has come, and he's got uh, angels that are coming, these three angels that are coming with powerful messages in the book of Revelation. And Pastor Jenkins has done a wonderful job uh, bringing out those wonderful prophecies of the book. He's done a fantastic job, and I pray for him. I pray for him because, uh, as many of you may know, I share that uh, Pastor Jenkins, of course, is doing the prophecies of Revelation, and I'm uh, trying to bring forth to you what the Bible says in the book of Daniel. And, and we had prayed for him because he had a sister who was uh, terminally ill with cancer. And even with our prayers, her sickness, in fact, truly was unto death. Uh, but what that has done for him, it has just allowed him to share the word of God even stronger. And so our condolences are to him. Uh, but the message that God has given him, he has shared with you, and we continue to share it as we can. So when does this judgment begin? When does this final judgment that is talked about in the book of Daniel, chapter, when does it begin? Now, in Daniel chapter 7, it tells us where it was, but Daniel chapter 8 tells us when it will begin. You know, of our five S's that we talked about, let's see if we remember them. Uh, we dealt with the spirit of prophecy. Uh, we dealt with the second coming. You remember that, and we look forward to that, and we talk about that throughout this whole series. Uh, one section that... Uh, uh, needs even further study is the state of the dead to explain that and then there is the sanctuary of which we're talking about tonight and of those five did I miss one uh, did I miss one there is one that's vital and the one that is vital is dealing with the Sabbath so those are the five S's that we study as we go through this study so what is the cleansing of the sanctuary what does this cleansing mean you know, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, that 40 years of wandering around the wilderness, God always has a, a plan of allowing his children to stay connected with him. Uh, and his plan was awesome. And they could tell when God was uh, in the presence of them, uh, there was a cloud and there was, there was the smoke above uh, the sanctuary. And, and those who were charged as the priest knew when God was there. Uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary, though, uh, was done annually. And what it was, because the sanctuary was used to bring animals, to sacrifice, a way of taking the sins and bringing them before God. And so animals had to be sacrificed, and your sins were transferred from you to the animal. What a wonderful system God has, uh, that he always has a way of taking away our sins. Even today, he's left us with the Lord's Prayer, that we can go and we can confess our sins to him. And 1 John 1, 9 says that if we are faithful, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us of our sins. You never want to let your sins build up. Uh, the Lord's Prayer is a daily prayer. In fact, we uh, say it each day uh, because it asks the Lord to give us our daily bread. And we ask the Lord in that prayer to forgive us of our sins. 
And so the sanctuary, after a year of all of these animals being sacrificed, all these sins, can you imagine if that had to be the case today, that you had to bring animals to the, to the temple, to the church? Uh, I imagine, I, I told him there'd be truck loads of animal uh, trucks out there. You've seen them, the ones with the big trailers and the holes in it, full of animals because of our sins are so much. There'd be blood running in the streets. The great thing is that there is an animal that takes care of our sins. And we know that animal today more than ever, and that is the lamb. That is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. That is Jesus, the lamb. And so this annual sacrifice and this annual cleaning uh, uh, of the sanctuary because of the sacrifices that had been happening all year long, uh, it was a cleansing. It was a day of judgment for Israel, symbolizing final judgment. Uh, what God has is God has, um, I tried to explain it, uh, something my mother used to do, and she may be listening. She, she used to make uh, uh, women's clothes, and sometimes she would have on the table, the, the dining room table, uh, these things called patterns. And I remember as a youngster, she would have these patterns, and she'd have material that she'd cut the material out based on the pattern. And she would have safety pins. And some of you know what I'm talking about. And so the, the, the material would have to follow the pattern if the dress or the shirt or whatever she was making was going to, to, to fit or was going to be uh, usable. You had to follow the pattern. And God is so awesome. God has given a pattern himself. In fact, the earthly sanctuary was only a pattern of the true sanctuary in heaven. And so God said to, to Moses, he said, listen, let them make me a sanctuary where I can dwell with them. God is always making a connection to his children, always offering a branch for those who desire salvation. And so when would this final cleansing of the sanctuary or final judgment begin? Remember now, we're talking to, we're talking about a sanctuary on earth that God told Moses to build, he gave him specific instructions to do it. All the way down to the curtain hooks and the color of the curtain and all the way down to the, the altar when you, when you would come into the courtyard, uh, there, was a, there was an altar there where the animals uh, would be put on the, the altar of, uh, of, of sacrifice. And, and, and then inside of the two compartment place of the tabernacle, the sanctuary, it had both names, you had the first compartment, which was the holy place. So you'd bring your animals there. There was the altar outside where animals would be slaughtered. And then you had a laver where the priests could wash their hands uh, before they go into the holy place. And in the holy place, there were only three pieces of furniture in there. Uh, you had the, the candlesticks on the left, which there were seven. Remember I told you there's something about the number of seven. Uh, those candlesticks represented the seven churches. In fact, if you go to the book of Revelation, if you're doing your study with Pastor Jenkins, I'm sure he's brought to you about uh, the seven churches. And if not, all you have to do is go to the book of Revelation. If you are a follower of this Christ, the very first verse of Revelation says it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if we're followers of Jesus Christ, I want him to be revealed in my life. How about you? And so there were other two pieces of furniture in there. And then there was the altar uh, there that was for incense, the altar of incense. And that's where the prayers of the saints were offered up to God. No matter how well we pray today, and no matter how often we pray today, our prayers still have to be fashioned for heaven. Our prayers have to be mingled. Our prayers have to be, you can't just pray, and it goes right into the heavenly realm. Your prayers have to be fashioned in such a way that it is given to a holy God who would even receive the prayer requests of an unholy people. So you had the candlesticks, seven of them, and you had candles in there. And it's fascinating how God describes it, how Christ talks about it in the book of Revelation, that each candlestick is representing the church. And those churches represent the history of time. It is awesome that the Bible, again, is not just a holy book, but the Bible is a historical book. And each of those churches, then they're represented, were actual churches as well. But they represented the time of the Christian world 
all the way from the very beginning of the church in Ephesus, all the way to the very last church, number seven, the church of Laodicea. Check it out. It's in the book of Revelation. You can see it. And so in that first part of this two apartment sanctuary, tabernacle, uh, you had the candlesticks, all seven. You had the altar of incense. And then you had the table of showbread. And that table of showbread was a reminder that this God supplies all of our needs. And the priest, his job was to ensure that there was bread on the table at all times because God supplies our needs at all times. And that was part of the daily that he had to do. There were daily sacrifices that were to be done. There were daily things that were supposed to be done that God had commanded. And so when we hear of someone or something that's trying to take away the daily, oh, that gets my attention. That calls for further study. And so when would the cleansing of the sanctuary, the final judgment begin? Keep in mind now, you're talking two different things. You're talking the earthly sanctuary and that once a year annual cleansing of the sanctuary, which was significant of the final judgment. And then, my friends, there's going to be a final judgment. And that final judgment, even though there's an earthly sanctuary, there's a heavenly sanctuary, and the earthly sanctuary is a pattern of the heavenly one. And what is done on earth at that annual cleansing of the sanctuary, that annual final representation of final judgment, there is coming a final judgment, everybody. And the Bible speaks of that. Here's what it says in Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Oh, I love this God. He doesn't leave anything out there and anything for you to wonder about. For those who love him and those who want to know, he gives the answers. 2,300 days. Well, I can imagine that Daniel was hearing that, and he could almost calculate 200 and 300 days out ahead, and that may be even during his lifetime. That may be even during the time of his people lifetime. But we know that God is talking prophetic things. And even though he's talking to him about the earthly sanctuary, he's also talking to him about the heavenly sanctuary. Oh, I love the heavenly sanctuary. And I told you, I, I, I'm a person that uh, when you have those uh, 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 Tootsie Roll pops, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, with, the, with the chocolate gooey center and the hard shell. And I told you, I have a hard time. I got a couple of those the other day. Don't tell anybody. And, and, and I still, even at my age, I, I try to sit there and see if I can just wait, 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 and let it dissolve until I can get to the center. And I think I, I, think I held off about five seconds, and I crunched and right, went right to the center. That's how the word of God is. It is so awesome that you just want to know what's going to happen next. So when I think of the heavenly sanctuary, I've learned that that's where Jesus is today. Anyone who wants to know where Jesus is, he is in the heavenly sanctuary, and he is doing the same daily duties as his pattern on earth was required to do. How do I know? That earthly priest was there so people could bring their animals to sacrifice them. Uh, they came and they brought their prayers and prayers went up. And as our Savior is in the most holy place today, in the heavenly sanctuary, we pray to him. And every prayer we uttered is in the name of Jesus. Just as the animals were used on the earthly sanctuary to be slaughtered, our heavenly Father gave his son who was slaughtered. And because of his death and because of the blood that flowed, you and I can be saved, everybody. He truly is the lamb that died. And so you had the first compartment of this earthly sanctuary that was the holy place. In fact, I would love for you to come and study with us. We have graphics and uh, that's our bread and butter. We love talking Daniel and Revelation. If you come and really want to study with us, uh, we can get into a deep study. Uh, and we love to see what the word of God says about it. And you'll be able to see it. Uh, but there was a curtain, a petition that was huge. In fact, it was so high up that no man could reach up and move it or change it. And it separated those two compartments in that earthly sanctuary. Uh, the first part we told you is called the holy place. 
Oh, but beyond that veil, beyond that partition, was a place known as the most holy place. And behind the curtain, even though we could not peer behind there, we knew behind that curtain because the word of God tells exactly what's behind there. It was the Ark of the Covenant, uh, and in it was the commandments of God. And oh, I love all that, but I love what's set on top of it. There are two angels on top of it, but there is also something known as the mercy seat. And I thank God for this mercy. I thank God for the mercy seat. I thank God for the law of God that's in there. And the law of God is in there just because we can't keep God's law. And as Pastor Jenkins shared with you, even in Revelation, I share with you, the law is not for salvation. The law is so you can see your condition. That's what the law is for. And God forbid, Jesus said himself, he has not done away with the law. Just because you couldn't do it didn't mean that God abolished it. In fact, Jesus himself said, I come not to destroy the law, but I come to fulfill it. Why? Because you all couldn't do it. Everything about Jesus' life, Jesus came to be a model to demonstrate to the Father and to everybody else, most importantly to that devil who said nobody can do what you ask him to do. Jesus came and he did everything that his Father asked him to do all the way to the cross. And on the cross, he uttered out those three words, it is finished. Allowing his father to know that everything he asked him to do, he had done. And so this earthly judgment that would happen, this end of the year cleansing of the sanctuary because of all the sins, was symbolic of a day of judgment that we all will face. All of us will face it someday. All of us will stand before uh, God and every word that's been uttered. Every action. I'm so glad that God deals with us by our hearts and our minds uh, because we're not always on point every day. I don't care how uh, great of a Christian you believe you are. Your consistency level is not very good. And God does not go one day and write your name in the book of life and then the next day scratch it out. This is based on a lifetime. In fact, uh, sanctification is a lifelong process. And we're sanctified by the word. That's what John 17, 17 says. The word sanctifies us. So Jesus, as he left, as he completed the mission, as he did everything his father told him to do, as he said, it is finished, he left. And when he left us, he left us to go to that heavenly sanctuary where he is today. Interceding on our behalf. You ought to say amen, everybody. No matter where you are, I don't care if you've been sequestered for four months. We still have a Savior who loves us and keeps us. So the book of Daniel shares that. The book of Daniel is awesome. The book of Daniel allows us to see how God is working. Uh, let's look at some questions here. Here's question number one. Daniel's vision in chapter 8 is similar to which earlier vision the prophet received. Well, we know that because we know that his earlier vision was of animals. We talked about that earlier. Here's what it says in the word in Daniel 8.1. It says, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at first. And just like my first vision, as I was laying on my bed, I was getting my rest, and this vision just came to me. Uh, question number two says, what two symbolic animals does Daniel describe in chapter 8? Well, we opened the book. We read it ourselves. Here's what it says. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns which were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Uh, this is interesting. It goes on to say, I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hands, but he did according to his will and became great is what he saw. Daniel is dreaming and he sees animals again. Saw this ram, and as his dream continued, his vision, here's what he saw. He said, as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and it touched not the ground. This thing must have been flying. 
and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. I'm like you, I was wondering, Daniel, what do these animals represent? We know with the animals that you dreamed about earlier, they represent the kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar saw, Babylon and, and the Medes and the Persians and, and Greece, and, and it represented Rome. What do these new animals represent? And so the question is, what kingdom does the ram represent? Well, the word of God answers the question. Here it is in Daniel chapter 8, verse 20. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. You remember this ram had two horns. One was, one was stronger, taller than the other, and the, the, the taller one came up last, but it was greater than the other. And you know what it was? Uh, the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians was a dual kingdom. And so here's God, what he's doing, it's just like we said, he's repeating and enlarging because he told us about this kingdom that would come after Babylon, and the kingdom that he said that would come after Babylon in the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw was an image that had a chest of silver, and it represented the Medes and the Persians. But the Persians overcame the Medes, and that's what you see here with this he-goat. What kingdom does the he-goat represent? Well, it's just not my opinion, preacher. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, and the rough goat or the he goat is the king of Grecia, Greece. And the reason it moves so fast, God is so awesome, is because we know that the one who moved fast in Greece was Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great moved so fast in his military maneuvers that he conquered the then known Greece area, the then known world, in rapid pace. And as he did that, Greece took over Persia even as Alexander the Great moved his armies in the world of that day. Question number five, who does the large horn between the eyes describe? Well, here's what the book of Daniel says in Daniel 8, 21. And the great horn that is between the eyes, <laughs> I love it, that God is not ambiguous. He says it exactly like it is. He said, this is the first king, the first king. Question number six. How does Daniel describe the he-goat power which succeeds Greece? Uh, we had a slide here of Grecian Empire that takes over the empire of Persia, the he-goat versus the ram, and we know who won. We know that Alexander the Great took over Persia. We, we know that the image there that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed was now coming true. We saw these things that God has said, and because God knows the future, we're seeing it revealed. Here's Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. And out of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the hosts of the stars to the ground and it stamped upon them. You know, this, this, uh, this, this, this ram uh, that was, was taken over by the he-goat and, and, and you can imagine the speed with which it came is the speed at which Alexander the Great moved, and you can see it coming. But this little horn here begins to do what we talked about in another chapter. Verse 11 of chapter 8 says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Now we're talking about the Lord here. This thing is going to magnify himself just like Nebuchadnezzar. You remember the tree? Something happens in people's minds when they get a little power. They begin to think that they are greater than the most high. And so, yeah, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. And the place of the sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. Oh, that word comes to when you're dealing with sin. Uh, we know what sin is. Sin is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. And so this entity is going to come and magnify itself against the, the prince of the most high. Didn't they learn a lesson what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? Didn't they not see the writing on the wall with his grandson Belshazzar? Uh, did they not see, as God had predicted, that Persia would, would, would also be a kingdom that, that would be taken over? And yet with every evidence of God's power, God showing them the future of things that would happen, here you have him magnifying himself and even being so bold as to try to take away the daily 
sacrifices. Those things were people were using the temple, the sanctuary to bring their sins before the priest. And the priest going in and doing his daily uh, duties of sprinkling the blood all throughout the year. And then one day out of the year, the most high priest or the high priest, not most high, but the high priest would go beyond the veil. You know, there's been so many stories I learned even as a kid that the high priest, when he would go beyond the veil from the holy place to the most holy place, it was said that he would have a rope on and he'd have bells on because if he had not taken care of his own sins, and once he went beyond the veil, he would lose his life and they would have to pull him out. The bells, as long as the bells were ringing, he was still moving. But if the bells stopped, they knew that his sins quite possibly had taken his life because he had come before a holy God and had not cleansed himself. How high does the little horn power attempt to exalt itself? Not only does it stop there, it says that it tried to take away the daily. 811, the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. Uh, uh, so with all that, where, where is our true high priest doing this? Where is the, the high priest? And, we know that Jesus is the high priest. We know that there was a, a, a replica on the earth, a, a, a pattern after heaven, and, and there was a, a, a there was a a, a, a priest that was uh, used to take care of uh, the daily uh, duties of helping uh, bring the blood of slaughtered animals for people's sins. And then the high priest would be go beyond the veil on earth, but in heaven, where is our true high priest today? Our true high priest today, the Bible tells us, and it tells us in Daniel chapter 8, verse 24, and I love this. You want to know where Jesus is today, everybody? Yes, he's left us with the Holy Spirit. Remember, he promised. He said, I'm going to pray to the Father that he will give you a comforter. And the way I see it, it's almost like a stage production. Just let me walk out on this limb a little bit. But on a stage production, there are different actors on the stage and when it's your time you do the role that you have and once your lines are complete then you move exit right and then the next comes on the stage Jesus came as a baby and he came to do everything the father asked him to do and he demonstrated it all the way to the cross but as he promised he said I'm going to ask the father because he knew once he had completed his mission now that the father would be pleased in his acts and the father was and he called him up to heaven and Jesus promised to ask the father to send somebody to comfort you even in the midst of corona even in the midst of death even in the midst of depression Jesus had the foresight to look ahead and be looking out for you and me that's the kind of God I like even on the cross he took time to take care of his mother that's the kind of Savior I want. And so this Savior, our true, our high priest, where is he now? Here's what the Bible says. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands. No, he's not in the earthly one. But he is, uh, that, that the earthly one is a figure of the true one. But he went into heaven itself. And, and, and look what the Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. It says, and now to appear in the presence of God... For us, he's our representative. He is our high priest. He is our intercessor. He is the judge, but he's also the lawyer in our case. And that's where Jesus is now. So where is God's true sanctuary now? The true sanctuary, and we're not talking about the pattern. Uh, after my mom would cut out all those pieces of material, and they would look so strange on it with all these pins all over the place, and and, and, and then she'd get her sewing machine. After she'd take the pins out, she'd have all these different pieces of material. And I, I'm down on the floor with my cars, and I'm just watching her. And she takes the material. She begins to sew it. And before long, that pattern has set that material in place. And that material began to look like the package, which had the dress on the package. And I had some younger sisters, or well, they're not young, I'm the youngest, but I had some sisters that were young. 
and that she would take and make dresses for them uh, for days like today. Uh, that's what she would do. She would make sure that they had dresses that were dresses alike, uh, and it would be awesome with what she would do, taking the pattern and making it as it was supposed to follow the real deal. You see, the sanctuary on earth that Moses built was only a pattern of the real deal. In the one on, on earth, uh, for a time, while they were moving through the desert, the Ark of the Covenant was there. Uh, people wonder where that's at today, and I know they've made all kind of crazy movies and everything. I believe that God took his covenant with him. I believe that the Ten Commandments that were in the Ark of the Covenant, along with Aaron's rod that was budding, along with bread, a reminder of this God taking care of all our needs. I believe that the earthly sanctuary, which was only a pattern of the real deal, where Jesus is today, so where is God's true sanctuary now? Here's what the Bible says. In Hebrew 9, 1 says, We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty, in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, uh, which the Lord erected and not man. Ha. Uh, I love it. He makes it so clear. So what question is asked in Daniel 8.13? Uh, Daniel 8.13 asks this question. How long, how long shall the vision, vision be concerning uh, the daily sacrifice and this transgression? How long, Lord, are you going to let this happen? It said that even under the altar of, of, of incense and prayers, the, the voices of the saints that have been martyred are asking, Lord, how long? And some of you may be asking that today. How long do we have to deal with this pandemic? How long do I have to stay in the house? How long is this thing going to last? And nobody knows the answer but a God who knows the future. And here's the answer that is given to Daniel in 8.14. And this is what God is saying. And this is why the book of Daniel chapter 8 is the longest time prophecy in the Bible. Daniel gives a time period of 2,300 days and then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And we know that the earthly sanctuary was a reminder of the final judgment. So how long is a day in prophetic days? Because if, if that's the case in Daniel's day, he can count out 2,300 days. But God was speaking in prophecy because 30% of the Bible is in prophecy. So how long is a prophetic day? Uh, well, in the Bible, here's what we found out in Numbers 14.34. After the number of the days in which he searched the land, even 40 days each day for a year. So Daniel, he wasn't talking about 2,300 days. He was talking about 2,300 years. In fact, we find that out even more so in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6. Here's what it says. Ezekiel 4, 6 says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. So 2,300 days is now 2,300 years. And do you know that the Bible even gives the timeline when the 2,300 years would begin and even when it would end? To what general period of time? does the vision of 2,300 years refer to? Well, I love the book of Daniel because it's not only the last time prophecy in the Bible and the longest, it also gives information that we need today in 2020. Here's the answer in Daniel 8:17. So he came near Gabriel, the angel came near Gabriel where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. And he said unto me, O oh, son of man, for at the time of the end shall the vision be. And he went on to tell him in 826, and the vision of the evening and of the morning, uh, which was true, which was told is true, wherefore, Daniel, shut it up, uh, for it shall be many days. Oh, there are some things in the book of Daniel were only for the end of time. Listen, everybody, we are not at the end of time, but we're living in the time of the end. And if you don't believe it, just take a casual look around. Uh, God wanted to let the world know that no matter how advanced you get, all he has to do is breathe on you, and he can shut the whole world down. And now we don't believe that God sent this virus, but we know that God allowed it to come because this God knows everything. 
And all evil, I'm going to give it to where it's truly from. This, this came from the devil. You want to know where this evil came from? That's exactly where it came from. He's trying to take out as many as he can because he knows he's got but a short time. Here's question 14. The Bible describes two sanctuaries, one on earth built by Moses and the other established in the heaven by God. What specific instructions did God give Moses? Here's what God told him. And you can read about it in Exodus 25, 8. God told Moses, and let them build me or make me a sanctuary where I may dwell among them. See, God knew that unless a man had a way to get his sins taken care of, he would always be contained and always have his sins forever with him. But God knew that man would try to think of all kind of ways to have his sins taken care of. In fact, even today, you got people who want to take their sins to a priest. God never said that. How can somebody forgive a sin that is against God? I shared that one evening in a prayer meeting. If I owe the deacon money, how is the sister over there going to give me uh, forgiveness of the, of the money I owe him? And I'm sure the deacon would look at her and say, Sister, you don't have that authority. And God says that to the priest today. You don't have the authority. He says that to the pope today. You don't have the permission to forgive sins. Sins are a transgression against me, my law. And only God can forgive sins. But God also knew one thing that man had to understand that there was a price to be paid for your sins and the price was Jesus died and the blood of Jesus is what covers our sins. In fact, in Hebrews 9.22 it says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Uh, there is no remission uh, unless there is blood shed. Adam and Eve found that out. Even after they sinned in the garden, they tried to cover themselves with leaves. And leaves couldn't do it because leaves are plants. And God came and he covered them with skins. And I guarantee you that whatever animal God had to take those skins from did not give it up voluntarily. And that animal that was skinned had to die for the first time they saw death. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It is therefore necessary, as what Hebrews 9.23 says, that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And then Leviticus goes on to say this, For on the day that the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse to you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. That's what the earthly tabernacle did. Oh, but the one that God has made with hands on earth, the veil was torn. And when the veil was torn, it was torn from that high point down, signifying that only Christ had the ability to take away our sins because as the lamb, the true animal, was sacrificed for our sins and died, the partition was torn and God has given us an opportunity to have a savior who is there for us. Friends, tonight, Daniel chapter 8 is just a reminder of the love that God has for us. It's a reminder that God has a plan for us. It's a reminder that God knows the future. And it's a reminder that God will save us from the uttermost, uh, from the guttermost to the uttermost, whatever it may be, God is willing to save us. There's some good news I want to share with you before I go. The good news, first of all, is found in Romans 6.23. Eternal life is free, everybody. It is a gift. Uh, Romans 3.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but Romans 6.23 says that he gives a gift to us. And Romans 5.17 and 18 says that our eternal life is a free gift. Uh, but what we've learned in Jeremiah 13.23 and, and also in John 15.5, write it down, we can't save ourselves. Nothing we can do to save ourselves. God loves us and doesn't want any one of us to perish. Second uh, Peter 3 9 will assure you of that. However, in Romans 6 23, if we accept Jesus as our Savior and Lord by faith and repent and confess our sins, this God is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friend, tonight, a special evening. An evening where the world is celebrating a God who sacrificed his son to save us. 
God who, a holy God who wanted to save an unholy man. And so he sent Jesus. And Jesus came for you and me. What a terrible, terrible waste of a life to not accept the gift that God has given. What a terrible a way of life not to accept the invitation that God has sent to you. So my invitation is to you tonight on this day. My invitation to you on a special day like today, understanding that we have a risen Savior who died for us, who is willing to protect us and love us. Even if this virus takes our lives, he is still true to his word. He will save us. Not necessarily being saved here on earth, but Eternal salvation is what we're talking about tonight, everybody. And I don't know where you stand. I don't know if you've made your election sure. Uh, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And we want you to know that this same God is offering that invitation to you as well. This same God is offering you the invitation to come. To come. And so our prayer tonight is that you will accept. Father in heaven, Save us. Save us, Lord. Save us from a, a pandemic. Save us from a virus. But Lord, save us from the illness that comes from sin. And Father, if there is a loved one that's sleeping today because of this illness or even because of some other illness that have come their way, you can still save them in the real eternal life. And so, Lord, for that, we accept your invitation. We accept it, Lord. We receive it. We ask you, Lord, to allow us to fully take grasp of it and fully to understand that there is a day of cleansing coming. Uh, there is a time of judgment coming. And, Lord, we love your blessings. And, Lord, we still want to be saved. Keep us now as we move forward into a new day. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful day, everybody. God bless you, and we look forward to being with you again on Tuesday.